Okay, so today we want to talk about um, spatial filtering, which is something that we talked about a little bit in passing when we were discussing, uh, it was kind of at the end of the uh, histogram operations lecture, but now I want to talk a little more about that in some detail. And this is actually a really important concept for all of, you know, image processing. So um, this is good that you guys are here, and for those of you that couldn't make it to class, you should definitely watch this lecture. Um, so, this is kind of an extension of things we talked about and have been talking about since you learned about signals and systems and uh, DSP, for those of you that took my class. So, the key concept from 1D signal processing is this idea of a, um, a filter in either the time domain or the frequency domain. We talked a lot about this relationship. Today, we're going to stay kind of thinking about time domain filtering, right? So, we had this concept where we had an output signal and an input signal, and then we had a filter, and we got the output by this operation called convolution, where we took the input and we convolved it with the filter. And what that meant was that we had, you know, the entries of X, right, which we could think of as, you know, entries like this. And then we had the entries of H, which we could think of like this. And the convolution sum in discrete time was defined as follows, right? We take, to get the nth output value, we convolve the input with the filter. And what this means in, in terms of a practical sense is that we take the filter, we flip it around, and then we run it across the input signal. And at every point, we kind of align these two corresponding elements and multiply them together and add them up, and that's what convolution is, right? And so that was kind of a very key concept for uh, one-dimensional signal processing, right? And so in DSP, for example, we talked about how could you get the optimal filter coefficients to solve a certain problem, right? So we talked about like the, the Wiener filter, for example, or adaptive filters or FIR filter design, things like that, okay? So it, as, as a side note, we also talked about how these filters worked in the frequency domain, right? So we also kind of talked about um, I'm not going to talk about this much today. The frequency domain was this other world where we talked about, for example, uh, a low pass filter like this, right? This was, for example, an equation of a low pass filter where we said, okay, all the frequencies below a certain cutoff frequency stay in, all the ones above stay out, right? And those kinds of concepts do also apply to image processing. We'll talk more about that stuff next week, okay? For today, I want to stay in the kind of two-dimensional analog of the time domain, okay? So we can also kind of do this notion of taking a small filter and sliding it around an image to produce a result in image processing. So in 2D, the kind of analog to time domain filtering is what you call spatial domain filtering. And so what I mean by that is, you know, how was a filter defined in 1D? Well, a filter was defined like you might have seen me drawing filters like this, where I would say, you know, here is a simple filter in 1D, and I underline to indicate that this is the zero element of the filter, right? The same thing applies in 2D, but instead of giving you a, you know, a list of numbers, instead I give you a grid of filter coefficients, right? And so, for example, this one here indicates the zero, zero element. Now I have to think about zero in both horizontal and vertical directions. And then I also have to specify, you know, some other numbers like this. Now, I will say that all this is a lot more, uh, what did I do? All this is a lot more tedious than it looks. I feel like I should uh, be minus one zero. Right. Right. So, I still feel like I did something wrong here. I got two minus one ones. 
This should be minus one, minus one, minus one, zero. Minus one. Oh, it should be one, zero, right? This should be minus one, one. This should be h of. Boy, I really screwed this up. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have to know when to quit and just start drawing again. Okay, so this is going to be the zero row, right? So if I move one over to the left, this is like, so again, this is kind of one of these row column indexing things that you can get confused about. So I'm going to say, for example, I'm going to label these to make my life a little bit easier. And I'm going to say, okay, so this is going to be uh, the zero x and the minus one y, just, just to be consistent, right? This is the one x. Consistency is the most important thing. So the good news is that you're never gonna really run into these kinds of like indexing problems in image processing, because for the most part, our filters are just numbers that are easy to understand, and often those numbers are symmetric around the middle. So we're going to talk later in class about a filter like this, for example. So kind of by convention, the element in the middle is always the one that we think of as the middle element, the one that's the zero, zero element. And usually we're going to deal with odd filters, odd size filters, like three by three or five by five, which means that you know things are going to be symmetric around the middle. Okay, And the way that we apply this filter to an image is we take this little block of numbers and we slide it across the overall image, right? So kind of to show a bigger picture, let's suppose this is my big image. And just to save ink, I'm not going to draw too many pixels, but let's draw a little bit of a grid. So if I want to know what is the filter response at this pixel, what I do is I center my filter over that pixel, and then I multiply corresponding elements and add up, right? So for example, suppose that I took this filter from the previous page, five minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, like this, and I centered it on top of this pixel, then the idea would be that if my input image was i of x, y, and my output image was j of x, y, then in this example, j of x, y would be gotten by saying, take five times the corresponding element at i, and then subtract off each of the four neighbors. OK? So all we're doing when we're filtering an image is we're taking this little block of pixels and we're sliding it over the image and at every point we do some sort of arithmetic operation where we you know multiply the center pixel by something and then subtract the neighbors or add the neighbors with something okay and the topic of today's lecture is mostly what kinds of filters might we want to apply to images to achieve certain image processing tasks so let me stop and ask any questions about the mechanics of, of applying the filter okay so just one comment is that you know, there are times when your filter, just like in, in 1D image processing, there's times where your filter, for example, may not cover the whole image, right? Uh, in that case, you can do either one of two things. Either you can kind of just ignore the pixels where you don't have a complete set of neighbors. So you might say, okay, there's actually no response at this pixel at all because I don't have enough neighbors. Or you might just hallucinate that there are zero values outside the boundaries of the image, which means that your, your response at this pixel is not going to be totally accurate, but you'll get at least some response, right? And so when you do filtering in MATLAB, you can, you can get you know, either of these behaviors. You can either say, I want an image that's the same size as my output image. That's usually what you want because you're usually putting this image through some sort of pipeline where you assume it's not going to change shape. Or you can say, OK, you know, I don't care about the size of the image. I just want to make sure that I don't get any weird values at the edges, right? So we'll see some of phenomena like that as we do, through our, do our MATLAB examples. OK, so let me just make the point with convolution in 2D one more time, and then we'll never talk about it again, really. Um, the idea is that I can think of my output uh, image as you know, the sum 
over some range of pixels of my filter times, um, so this is kind of like mathematically what we're doing when we're filtering. And sometimes, actually, you may hear me say that I call this a mask. So, so this is a filter. And sometimes you also hear it called a mask because it's like taking, you know, this this you know, block and superimposing it on top of the image, right? So it's kind of like what pixels of the original image does that mask cover, right? So sometimes I'll say filter, sometimes I'll say mask. Okay, so this process, right, is pretty similar looking to the uh, equation for convolution, right? The only difference is that if we were doing convolution, this should be a minus sign and this should be a minus sign, right? Instead, what we're doing actually is more like a discrete version of correlation, right? Um, so let's just say it looks almost like convolution. It's actually, you know, more like correlation. The only difference being whether I flip the mask around like the same way that I'd flip a filter when I'm doing a 1D signal processing problem. So again, for our intents and purposes, almost all the time our filters are going to look something like this anyway, so whether we flipped it or not doesn't really make that much of a difference, right? So conceptually, you can kind of think about this like convolution, okay? And again, the why did we, why did we care about convolution in one-dimensional signal processing? Well, a big reason was that, would let, that let us use this whole Fourier transform machinery of analyzing signals in the frequency domain, and we're going to talk a lot about that in the next week. You can do the same things with images, right? Um, so there are some filters that are useful to think about in the spatial domain of just what are my set of coefficients I should slide over the image, and there are some filters that are easier to design in the frequency domain for certain tasks, right? So if I've got some sort of a, we'll, we'll talk about how frequency manifests itself in the image world next week, okay? So that's going to be kind of the preview. Okay, so just to say that the reason that this is good is that it means the very same thing that, you know, filtering in the spatial domain, which is this kind of convolution process, is equivalent to multiplication of two Fourier transforms in the frequency domain, right? Just like in 1D signal processing. And so that means that, again, to do frequency domain filtering, as we'll discuss, we can either, you know, design the corresponding spatial filter and run it across the image, or I could take the Fourier transform of image one, the Fourier transform of the filter, multiply them together, and then take the inverse Fourier transform. So we're gonna talk about that technique next time. So really what I wanna focus on today is what are useful kinds of spatial filters, right? So if I'm gonna design a little block of pixels to run over the image, why would I wanna do that and what kinds of pixel blocks might I use, okay? So there are really, I think, two key kinds that I wanna talk about today. So one kind is called a smoothing filter. And, you know, this is also known as a low-pass filter. So we're really familiar with low-pass filter uh, ideas from signal processing, right? Where, you know, we know that a low-pass filter is one that looks like you know, it, it, if we're doing audio signal processing, the effect of that will be to take out all the high frequency sounds. So things like, you know, cymbals and, and so on in a jazz thing will get filtered out by a low pass filter and we'll only have low frequency instruments like the bass, right? And so what is the uh, equivalent in two dimensions, okay? So another way to think about, another way you sometimes hear these discussed is like a moving average filter. And so the idea is um, to replace each pixel by a weighted average of its neighbors. Okay, and so why are we going to do that? So kind of um, 
the good thing about this, as we'll see in just a second, is that kind of removes or at least reduces certain kind of noise in an image. I think the last problem on the homework one talked about filtering an image, and I believe you saw the effects of that. We're going to do a lot more of that on homework three. On the other hand, what we're going to see is this kind of blurs the image or removes detail. Okay. And so the idea is that, um, again, I want to replace every pixel by a weighted average. Okay, so if I wasn't doing any filtering at all, I could imagine that a filter block would look something like this. Just the identity, or actually this is not the identity matrix, this is like a filter that only has one element and says the output pixel should be exactly what the input pixel is, right? So it's not really a filter at all. Instead, I could have a low pass filter that says something like, okay, I want there to be, you know, an average of the pixels in this three by three neighborhood. And that would mean that my filter should look like this. And to avoid all these kind of crappy fractions, I often will write the filter like this, where I just keep integers in this box and any fractional stuff I put on the side. Okay, so let's think about what the effect of this filter does. So let's go over to MATLAB. Actually, so actually, before I go to MATLAB, let me just say one thing, which is that um, you know there are two ways of filtering in MATLAB. So one way is uh, so it's a little bit confusing, unfortunately, um, the syntax. But let me. Kind of show it to you. So one way is basically saying I can use this command called filter to. Okay, so there's a there's a command called filter for 1D image filter or 1D single filtering. There's a command called filter to for 2D image filtering. And the idea is that here what I would do is I would supply my filter and then my image. Okay. So the advantages of this are, you know, we get um, actual kind of floating point uh, results. The con is that it's not, you know, scaled or clipped to image range. So um, depending on whether you really care about the actual values or whether you just want to kind of see the effect of the image, the other option is a specific function from the image processing toolbox called infilter. For some reason, they flip this around so that you put the image first and then the filter. And the advantage of this is that, you know, um, if I have an image coming in, I also get the right image coming out. And then that also, you know, works with color automatically, so you don't have to worry about, you know, making it grayscale or applying it to every color channel. Um, the con is that you may lose uh, important values below zero or greater than 255. So we're going to talk about each of these guys, you know, what they do. So let's take uh, MATLAB here. And so for my image, I'm going to use, uh, what am I going to use for this? So it's freezing cold here, so I'm going to use some images from my Hawaii trip in January. So here's an input image, okay? And you can see it's got lots of detail in it. So if I zoom in, I can see, you know, that there's uh, actually maybe good examples over here, right? So there, like, there's all this fine detail in this wood carving. And I've subsampled this. So this is actually a much higher quality image, but I've made it smaller just so we can look at it in MATLAB, right? And so if I were to design a filter and apply it, so what I could do is I could say, here's my filter. I want it to be a three by three array of ones divided by nine, right? So this is exactly the filter that we just talked about on paper. 
And then there are two possibilities. You know, one possibility is to um, filter to the filter. And you know, Batlab helpfully pops up for me the fact that I put the filter first, so that's OK. Uh, it's going to give me an error here because the image is uh, you know, full 3D and not grayscale. So what I could do is I could just make a grayscale version of this image. Um, and then I can filter this grayscale version. And now if I you know, put them side by side, that's my original image. And this is my output image. And I wrote a little command side by side. Whoops, what happened here? I guess I have to, again, since this, I guess since this is a floating point image, I have to tell it to scale it um, to the visible range. OK, so if I compare these two things, you know, here, maybe not like super visible what the difference is yet. Like, it kind of, I think, looks like the right hand image, which is the filtered version, is a little bit blurrier, but it's not like super obviously blurry. And part of the reason is that the, the effect of the filter on the image depends a lot on the overall image size, right? So if this is like a 4,000 pixel high image and I'm scaling it to my MATLAB screen, then a 3 by 3 smoothing filter is going to have very little visible effect on what's going on. You're not going to be able to perceive the difference. Whereas if my filter gets bigger, I should see more of a difference. And so let's make my filter a little bit bigger. Um, so let's make this uh, a 15 by 15 filter, maybe a 25 by 25 filter. So that means that Let's, let's, try, let's try 15 by 15. So, and then I need to scale that by 225. Now I'm going to make an output image that is this filter. So now you can definitely see the effect of the blurring, right? So, for example, um, the big high level details are still present. But lots of small level details have gotten blurred away, right? So for example, all this detail that's in this area of the, whatever this is, kind of um, thatch, you know, and all these kinds of ripples on the wood and these palm trees here, all the fine details have kind of been smoothed away, OK? Um, and so you know, you might ask, why would I want to, to do that in the first place? So let me, just, let me just pause and say a couple things. So, one is, you know, why did I normalize the image to, to 0 to 255? So, or a better question is, why did I design my filter to be um, this instead of just, you know, this? Well, I mean, it's kind of a scaling issue, right? If I were to filter this image with this, and then I were to um, look at this guy scale to the same uh, range as before, what I would get would be like almost all white. The reason for that is that what my filter is telling me is add all the pixels together in my local neighborhood, right? And so you can imagine that that will quickly go above 255, right? So if my grayscale values are greater than, you know, 50 in every neighborhood, I add those nine values up, I get 450, I'm already beyond the image value, right? So in some sense, what I want to do is I want to have a smoothing filter where all the values in the uh, window add up to one, right? That means that the overall average intensity of the image is going to be basically about the same as it was before, right? If it doesn't add to one, the effect is going to be that the image looks a little bit brighter or a little bit darker, right? So for example, if I said something like H, say, say divided by um, eight instead of nine, right? This is like saying that, oops, this is like saying that the average will be like 112% brighter than it used to be. And I should be able to see that if I, um, oops, I forgot to actually show it. So it's a little bit hard to perceive perhaps on the screen, but the right-hand image, like if you look in this region here, right, so things look definitely brighter in the darker regions. That's like a, a small-scale version of what we saw where it got totally washed out earlier, OK? So now let's think about um, why would I want to do that in the first place? So um, for example, here are a couple of, of cases where it might be useful. Um, so let me read in this uh, 
not Hubble, yeah. Okay. So here's a image of stars and stuff, right? Pretty low resolution image. And suppose I wanted to find the, the major, you know, galaxies in this picture, right? If I just wanted to find them, I could say, well, okay, they're going to be big, bright, white spots, right? And if I were to just threshold the um, image to say, okay, show me all the stuff that's bigger than a certain value, I would get something that, you know, turns back all the bright stuff, but there are lots of little bits and pieces that are not germane to my interest, right? Um, so you could argue that there are some ways to get rid of these small white dots, and we'll talk about that as a whole separate lecture later in the class. Another thing I might do instead would be to say, okay, let's suppose that I were to just filter this image, right? I want to blur it out so that all the small detail stuff gets blurred away and only the really big detail stuff remains, right? So if I were to blur out this image again, let's, let's use this big uh, filter from before and filter it out. So here I can use this because it's a straight out um, grayscale image. Whoops. So again, I did this thing. I have to scale this to 0 to 5. So here you see that the effect of filtering is to take, now here actually you can see that this is a kind of a crappy, this actually this is really weird. Oh, here's actually this is a good example of gamma correction, I think, because on my screen these images don't look anywhere near as crappy as they do on the on the HDTV, right? And I think that actually if you were to watch the videos, you would see they would look just fine, right? But here's an example where at least on this screen I see all this like crappy blocky compression noise, and I think that's because the dark pixels on my monitor are getting brightened up on the on these TVs here, right? So if I wanted to make it match up, yeah, it looks the same on those crappy. So if I want to make this match up to what I see on my screen, I would need to change the gamma a little bit to bring this darkness level down to make things comparable. There's an example of, of real-world image processing. Right? So, so things don't really you know, look this bad on my screen. But what I could do now is I could say, OK, so now just find me the stuff that's really bright over in this image. Things that used to be really bright, like for example this star here, have been kind of blurred out so they're not as bright as they used to be. And now if I were to threshold that image, um, say, show me all the stuff that is greater than 150. I guess not actually a lot of stuff past that. Oh, uh, it's because I scaled it like this. So not a lot of stuff passes that test. Only the big, bright stuff that has a lot of bright pixels in the first place comes by, right? So there's a way to do some quick fi image filtering to help me out. Another example, I didn't test this before I came, but I think hopefully we can make this work. So um, one thing that really bugged me about, so when I, when I got a high-definition high television, um, you started to notice artifacts in images that you didn't really perceive before. And so let me look at like, um, so, Here's an image from The Walking Dead. And this is actually from a Blu-ray, you know, DVD quality assessment site, right? So if you look at this, you can see that in the background, there's all this kind of graininess, right? This kind of, you know, film grain that makes, you know, it doesn't look like the background is sharp. It looks like, not only is it blurry, that's one thing, but there's also the kind of this, this you know, low quality chop, you know, choppy color in the back. Or here's, here, there's a show called Burn Notice. Burn notice, I thought, had like the worst HD image ever. So like, if we were to just kind of zoom in on like the hood of this car, for example, like look how noisy that yellow is, right? You kind of expect there to be like this nice, clean gradient across the hood of the car, and instead it has all this kind of image noise in it, right? And I think that, you know, it, I find it to be really distracting. Like if you look at, um, you know, like look at, the background of this guy's shirt, this woman's face, like it's, it's just so grainy to me that it was very distracting to watch. And so we can use um, image filtering to try to improve those kinds of images. So for example, if I were to uh, take the car example, so 
let's, in this case, so, so far I've been using filter2, right? And now let me use this other version of image filter, m filter. Okay, so let's use, um, first of all, let's see how big this image is. All right, 1080 by 920. So let me use basically a, say, 11 by 11 image filter. And on the left, I'm going to show the original image. And on the right, I'm going to show the filtered image. Actually, first I have to create it. So the syntax of in filter is really easy. Um, I just take the image and my filter. And I can see that my input image was a color UN date, and my output image is a color UN date. So here I don't have to do any sort of jogging around about converting stuff. And I should be able to just simply um, visualize the output. And so if I put these side by side, now you should be able to see that the right-hand image looks a lot smoother, right? So I think that if I zoom in on both these images, right, so if I kind of zoom in on the, the hood of this car here and here, I can see that I've removed that noise, right? So now it doesn't look this kind of grainy noise anymore, which is good if my objective was noise removal. On the downside, I can see that I definitely lost some image detail, right? And that's the inevitable flip side of low-pass filtering is that the high-pass stuff, which as we'll learn further on in the class, kind of corresponds to image edges, the high-pass stuff is kind of lost, right? So the, sh the image just generally looks less sharp. So, you know, this is the trade-off, right? Either you get rid of noise or you have to, uh, you know, get rid of edges. No, I don't. If you get rid of noise, you also get rid of edges. That's kind of the way I think about it. Okay, so let me pause and ask. So any questions about low-pass filtering? And I think actually I have a, a problem on the homework that's exactly like this for, you know, another frame from burn notice at some point, right? Okay, but I think this is actually a really compelling example, right? Because, I mean, look how crappy that original image is. And so if I wanted to, I mean, I guess we could explore. So I, I chose maybe a too big of a filter, right? So if I wanted to choose a slightly smaller filter, I would get a little bit um, better uh, denoising, or a little bit worse denoising, but also I'd keep more edges. Right, so here, you know, I use a three by three filter, and things are probably actually, a, you know, sharpness wise not so bad. And if I were to zoom in on this, you know, area here, you know, you can still see some noise, but not as much noise as there was before, right? So I could kind of play with my, you know, filter size to try and get the trade off between denoising and sharpness that I want. Okay. Alrighty, so let's close these guys up. And. So, like I said, most of the stuff that I was uh, doing here uh, were along the lines of, um, you know, ones in MATLAB of n divided by n squared, right? If I wanted to, um, I could also kind of emphasize the middle pixel more, right? So this is like basically saying, take all the pixels in the window, give them equal weight, right? But there's no reason that I couldn't, for example, say, okay, I want to give the pixel in the middle weight 4, and I want to give these guys on the edges weight 2, and I want to give these guys on the periphery weight 1, right? That's kind of like something that is, you know, emphasizing, keep the middle pixel, you know, give that guy the most weight, and then give me a little bit of a roll off. Or I could use, um, you know, kind of like a 2D equivalent of a Gaussian distribution, right? So we kind of talked about this in probability, right? What I could do is I could build a little Gaussian distribution with a certain variance, and then I can turn that into digital filter coefficients. And that gives me kind of, again, some sense of what the roll-off is. And by tuning the uh, variance of the Gaussian, right, so by kind of tuning this sigma that defines the variance of the Gaussian, I can make the image filter either almost flat like this, or I can make it very skinny like, you know, just the identity almost. Okay, actually, just as a comment, for this I would need to normalize this to the sum of these elements, right? So these add up to 16. So this would be better because then I would make sure that the intensity of the image corresponds to what it originally did. Okay. So, 
if on the one hand we have sharpening filters, or I'm sorry, smoothing filters, on the other hand we have sharpening filters. So So image averaging, in some sense, is kind of related to integration, right? Averaging means adding stuff up, right? Which is like integrating. And so it stands to reason that if I want to do the reverse of blurring, that is making the image sharper, instead of looking at the sums of pixels, I should look at the differences of pixels. That's kind of like taking the derivative of an image, okay? And so um, image differencing which is kind of related to differentiation, you know, results in sharpening. So let's think about, um, let's go back to one dimension for just a second and think about an image edge, okay? So um, let me draw this on a new piece of paper. So let's suppose that I have an edge and I'm going to scale things between 0 and 10 for the purposes of this example, okay? And so for a ways, I have intensity 0, then I maybe have a climb up to 10, I stay at 10, then I quickly drop down to 0, then I stay at 0, then I jump up with a step to 10, okay? And so the image values here, like the, the grayscale intensity values along this edge, may look something like, you know, uh, 0, 0, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 10, then I drop down to 5, then I drop down to 0 again, 0, 0, then I jump up to 10, and then I stay at 10, right? So this is like, you know, the original function, okay? Now, what if I were to take the derivative of that function? Okay, so in the discrete world, the derivative is basically like taking the difference between adjacent values. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, at each value, give me the difference between the guy in front of me and where I am now, right? So this minus this is 0, this minus this is 0, this minus this is 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Now I come down, this minus this is 0, this minus this is minus 5, minus 5, 0, 0, 10, 0, 0, 0, 0. Right, so this is the first derivative. Or the first difference. And so here, I can kind of see that, um, you know, places where the derivative is large show me places where the image is changing quickly, right? Which corresponds to image edges between light and dark. So I could say, for example, I could look at this image derivative and threshold on the absolute value of this and say, okay, if I want to find places where that derivative is greater than, you know, 4, I'll find this strong image edge and I'll find this, you know, strong downward slope, but this gradual slope up is not enough to trigger that, you know, detector, right? So the other thing to notice is that, you know, here I basically have a constant derivative going along the edge, right? Whereas really maybe what I want to do is I want to localize the points in the image where the edge starts and the edge stops, right? So the other thing I could do is I could take the kind of second derivative. So the second derivative is going to do the same thing. So now I'm going to take this, the differences of these guys. So I'm going to get 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 2, uh, minus 5, 0, 5, 0, 10, minus 10, 0, 0, 0, right? So if I were to take the um, second derivative, I'm only going to find large values at the kind of onset and offset of the edge. And also what I observe is kind of a sign change, right? So when, you know, here, this goes from positive to negative. So the idea is that um, both the first derivative and the second derivative can help me find edges in images. And the edges are really important for trying to sharpen up the image, okay? Because when we say sharpening, 
kind of what we mean is make the edges stronger, right? So find me these edges and, and do more with them, okay? And so let's think about how we can actually kind of put this into practice on an image. So basically, um, the first step in sharpening is to find a filter that reacts strongly to edges. Okay, and so um, let's again look at this in 1D. So in 1D, um, kind of the equivalent of this first row here, the first derivative, was a filter that looked like this, right? This is kind of the filter that I just applied to get that first row, right? And kind of in continuous time, that's like saying, you know, my, or it's kind of like saying, take uh, this value and subtract the value that I'm at. And this is an approximation to the first derivative of the function along the x direction. And if I looked at the second derivative, kind of the equivalent of the second derivative is applying this filter twice. And so the result of that is going to be basically this. It's like saying, take the guys on your end and subtract twice the guy in the middle. The corresponding filter there is going to be like this. And that's kind of approximately equal to the second derivative. And so what we learned from our little toy example was the absolute value of the derivative is large when there's an edge. And what we learned from the other example is that the second derivative shows you know, um, sign changes near edges, but um, is zero um, elsewhere. So in some sense, that gives me kind of a, a more local response, okay? And so what are the two-dimensional analogs to these filters, okay? So what I can imagine is, let's, let's focus on uh, this guy for the moment, okay? So kind of what I want to do is I want to apply this operation both in the x direction and in the y direction, okay? So the 2D version is to find edges in um, both x and y directions. And so we seek, or we use, an approximation of what's called the Laplacian. And that's just a fancy word for taking the second derivative in x and adding it to the second derivative in y. Okay. And so if you guys have taken a sort of like you know, physics classes or like heat transfer. You see the Laplacian come up a lot in differential equations and partial differential equations. So I wouldn't be surprised if you had seen this somewhere else, okay? Even just in third semester calculus, you probably talked about ways of combining derivatives in multiple directions, okay? And so what is the kind of uh, analogy here? Well, in uh, the image world, this is like saying this guy will be approximated by um, taking both of the x neighbors and subtracting the middle guy. This guy would be like saying take both of the y neighbors and twice the middle guy. And so overall, what I would have would be a filter that would look like this. So it's like saying take the four neighbors 
and subtract four times the middle value, right? And so the result would be a filter that looks like this. Minus four in the middle, one on the sides, okay? And again, I guess I could put zeros here just to fill it in. So again, if I put that filter right over the top of a constant flat region where all the pixel values are basically about the same, then these four values would be about the same as the inside value. When I put that filter on top of it, I should get zero response, right? On the other hand, if the middle value differs significantly from one of its neighbors, I'm going to get a large positive or negative response, right? So this filter is going to react strongly to edges. And so we can see that working in MATLAB, for example. So um, let's take uh, this is a very famous computer vision textbook that I always thought was like cheesily, uh, you know, funky, like Daft Punk uh, robot. So uh, I guess I have to make this into a grayscale image. Okay. So now let's make my filter. My filter is going to be uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, minus 4, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, and so now if I apply this filter to the image, so again, here's a case where it's a little bit, uh, where the importance of using filter to versus in filter is important to consider, right? Because seeing as now there's a negative sign in this image, it's certainly possible that if I have like a big positive, if I have a, if I have a pixel in the middle that's larger than its neighbors, I'm gonna get a, a large negative response, right? And if I were to use in filter directly, it will clip that to zero and I won't be able to see that negative response. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use filter two and remember which one goes first. Okay. Thank you, MATLAB. And so now I'm going to make another figure and I'm going to look at the output and I'm going to scale it so that the largest value is uh, actually, yeah, let's, let's see what I get here. Okay, so see how this looks on the screen. So here, kind of what you can see is that the image is mostly gray. Okay, so gray in this case corresponds to kind of neutral or zero, right? White corresponds to big positive difference. Black corresponds to big negative difference. And so what I see is along every edge, I find kind of a transition between black to white, right? So that kind of corresponds to that sign change that we mentioned earlier, and uh, I can see that almost everywhere, like this flat region of white here, or this you know dark region over here, or this even this kind of smooth gradient, you know the filter doesn't respond to that stuff because nothing is happening there. But where there are strong edges, I see that the filter is giving me some values, right? And so what I could do, for example, is I could threshold those values and I could say, okay, um, only tell me about um, the. So let's look at the maximum. Um, of these values in the minimum. So the maximum you know, response to this filter is like 400. So that means that if I were to look at only the edges that are stronger than say 200, then I get some subset of these edges, right? Which are presumably the ones that are really strong, right? So for example here, you can see that the strongest edges are the ones where there's like black to white transitions along the robot's body, right? If I wanted to kind of say, okay, I, don't, I want to find, you know, more edges than that, I can turn down my threshold and I start to see more of the edges. And here you can see that because of the way that the purple gradient to the background was scanned in, right, that there's a long, there's a stronger gradient between the R and the V in the background than there is between the, you know, R, the T and the N on the purple background. So it's kind of like this, you don't get the whole word text, you just get some of it. And if I were to tune down the threshold even more, I would see even more of the edges. To the point that if I turn down the threshold too low, then I start to see too many edges, right? So like this is just saying that if the pixel is different from its neighbor than like five 
image density values, you get like a bunch of crap. So you have to kind of be judicious about thinking about where you want to set your threshold to get the edges that are important to you for your application, right? So here, this is maybe getting closer to what I want, right? Okay. So let's see. Any questions or comments about this, first of all? Yes? You said it did a change from black to white. Say that again? You said that there's a change, uh, it would go gray, then black, and white, then back to gray for an edge. So for an edge, so here's the thing. So for a sharp edge, let's go back to looking at the raw output. So along an edge, what you expect to see is a transition like this that goes from black on one side to white on the other side, right? If the edge is really smooth, what you expect is, so, so suppose that there's like a, uh, like a stripe, right? So let's, will be a good example. So let's suppose that there was a white stripe, a black stripe, and then a white stripe. Then what I would expect to see would be on one edge of the stripe, I would have a black transition, and on the other edge of the stripe, I'd have a white transition because it's going from dark to light and light to dark, and in the middle, you don't see anything, right? All the edges in this image are fairly strong, and that's why basically along every edge, you just kind of see a dark to light transition immediately, right? So all that's going to be fine. Yes, that's right. So, yeah. Okay, other questions or comments? So this doesn't necessarily help me make the edges of the image stronger. It's right? so like this, this edge image is not an image that I would want to view coming out of Photoshop to improve my image, right? What I want to do instead is I want to say, okay, how do I make the image sharper? Well, what I do is I run this edge detector on the image, and then I add back in some fraction of these edges to the image to make the edgy pixels edgier, right? It doesn't do anything to the, to the middle part of the image, but for the places where there are edges, I'm, I'm kind of strengthening them up. And so let's go back to my, my, map, or my text for a second. So, um, so how to you know, enhance or sharpen edges or let's say images. The idea is to strengthen the edges of the original image. By adding a multiple of the edge map to it. So for example, what I might do is I might say, okay, my output image is going to be my input image, and I'm going to strengthen it by taking this Laplacian. So kind of here what I'm saying is um, this is my original image, which I can think of as a filter like this. This is the opposite of the filter I showed before, and it's not really important that I change the sign. Here I'm just making it so instead of having a negative in the middle, I have a positive in the middle. It just flips the sign of the edge image. And so if I add these together, what I get is saying take five times the guy in the middle and subtract its neighbors. Okay. And again, if I think about what this is going to do, this says, okay, well, if I'm about the same as my neighbors, right, then I have five times myself, I subtract off four times myself from the neighbors, and I have the same thing I had before. And so for regions that are basically constant intensity, this guy doesn't really do anything to the image. It keeps the same pixel. But for places where there's a big difference between where I am and my neighbors, I'm going to bump up that difference, okay? And so um, the result of that is as follows. So let's take a look. So actually here, let's use, um, instead of this robot image thing, which is a little bit more um, of a synthetic image. So um, here's an image I took at sunset at the top of the Mauna Kea uh, volcano in Hawaii. So this is like this nice image. It's downsampled a little bit so I can show it in MATLAB. 
you know, but it's kind of like, you know, a little bit blurry, a little bit hazy, you know, I mean, that's kind of one of the appeals of the image. It looks really nice and soft, right? So maybe what I want to do, just for the purposes of the example, is sharpen it up a little bit. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take the edge map and I'm going to add some stuff to it. Or I'm, I'm going to take the original image and I'm going to add things to it. So let me, first let me see what I do with defining this guy here. So here's my um, map I'm going to use. So I said it was going to be minus one, zero, minus one, five, minus one, zero, minus one, zero. Okay, so this is going to be the edge enhancing thing. And now I'm going to apply this to my image. So let's compare these, right? So here, a um, couple of things have changed, right? So for one thing, uh, the colors are a little bit shifted, right? Because here I'm adding, you know, I'm, passive, I'm possibly changing the intensities of the pixels a lot, right? So that's one thing. But the other thing is that the image generally looks sharper, right? So if I, for example, were to zoom in on, um, say I zoom in on like this hill here, right? So here, this hill looks like this. And here, it looks like this, right? So I can see it's kind of like I've sharpened up the edges of the image where it used to be this kind of, you know, um, easy image. Now it looks like it's been kind of, this is like what they do on CSI where they say enhance, you know, make it sharper, right? But there are also downsides to this, right? So the problem is that um, just like we saw in the low-pass filtering, right? When I low-pass filtered the noise out of the image, I also lost the edges, right? Here, when I enhance the edges, I also enhance the noise, right? So for example, look at the inside of this crater here, right? So here, this before had some noise in it just due to the low light of my camera. When I enhance the edges, that gets much noisier, right? So I can't have it all in some sense, right? So here, in trying to make the image sharper, I'm also taking any noise pixels and making the difference between the background and the noise a lot stronger, right? So that means that, you know, things like here, for example, here I can see things have kind of saturated almost, right? So here is this kind of area where there were lots of edges before. And now, actually, you can see these white pixels mean that I've saturated above 255 because this, the difference between the pixels, you know, the difference between the branch and the, and the ground was so high that it bumped up, up, bumped up above the 255 limit, right? So, you know, in some sense, here what I've done is I've been a little bit too aggressive about enhancing the edges, right? Instead, what I'd kind of like to do is just add a little bit of the edge image, not like 100% of the edge image, right? So I can kind of tune how much edginess I add back in, okay? So let's go back to my sheet for a second. So what did we just learn? So we learned that, um, you know, uh, noise is also sharpened. which is bad. Okay, so, and this is kind of like inevitable, right? I mean, you can't have one without the other. This kind of thing, though, is related to, you know, um, we can just add a fraction of the edges back in. For a more kind of subtle effect. And so this is related to a old photography technique that's called unsharp masking, which is a really confusing name. So the idea is as follows. So I make a uh, filter What is the easiest way to say this? So if my original image is, let's say, F, and if I think about a low-pass image, let's call that F bar, OK? Where the bar kind of stands for average, right? So we, we learned that when I average pixels, I get this kind of blurring effect, and that's kind of like a low-pass filter. 
And so that means if I subtract these two things, I should get a high pass filter, which basically corresponds to the edges. So if I have F minus F bar, you know, let's call that um, F high pass, for example. And then what I could do is I could say my output is my original image plus some fraction times my high pass image. And this is some you know, tunable parameter. So let's see how that works. So um, let's go back to my crater example. So what is the equivalent of what I just said? So my original image is a filter that looks like this, for example. Okay, that's like the identity. And then my low pass filter, let's suppose I use my, you know, my averaging in the three by three neighborhood. And my high pass filter is going to be the original image minus my low pass filter. Okay. And so again, if I take my, um, if I take my filter and I apply it to, eh, go away. If I apply the high pass filter to my image, uh, I guess I have to apply this to the grayscale value of the image. Right, so again, this is kind of like the edge map. Whoops, sorry. This is kind of like the edge map of my crater image, right? Zero where there's no uh, activity and you know black or white where there's some sort of edginess. And so again, if I zoom out to the area here, Right, like I can see this is like that crater that I was talking about before. It's basically flat inside here, and it's got some edge contributions around the edges of the crater, and then it's got lots of edginess inside the crater where we saw there was that kind of image noise from before. Right. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new filter that is um, this unsharp mask, and that's going to be some combination of the identity matrix so let's, let's make k equals you know, um, 0.5. So I'm going to say make a new filter that is the identity plus k times the high pass filter. Okay. And now if I uh, close the guys. So I'm going to basically start to filter this guy. with my new unsharp mask filter. I guess I actually should show, in this original guy, I should show the uh, RGB to gray guy for fair comparison. Okay. So now if I compare these two things, again, this is a little bit more of a subtle effect, right? So I think we could agree that, hopefully, we agree that the right-hand image, if you were to see them on a blind taste test, that you would think that the right-hand image was a little bit sharper than the left-hand image. If I kind of zoom in on these guys, you know, this versus this, you know, I think that we could agree that the right-hand image is sharper than the left-hand image, right? And if you didn't like that sharpness, then what we could do is pump up that, that fraction. So if I said k was equal to, you know, uh, say 0.8 instead of 0.5, and then I was to filter this guy again, I guess I have to make this guy. So now things are getting a little bit sharper, I think. Certainly like this, whereas before this region kind of looked a little bit muddy, now it's looking a little bit sharper. And I think it's also, you know, one thing that's important to notice is that this is also, it seems like it's getting a little bit lighter somehow. And again, why is that? Well, uh, if I were to look at the sum of the values of this unsharp mask, 
I get one, so I guess I was fooled. I thought that it was going to be a little bit lighter. All right, never mind. Forget that I said that. Um, oops. Okay. So the, the terminology, this, the naming of the unsharp mask, is a little bit confusing. I think that it comes from a, um, I think it comes from a photography technique, because really what you want to do is you're sharpening the image, and they're calling it unsharp masking. I don't know why that is. Okay. So two more things I want to touch on before I let you go. So one thing that we're going to talk about extensively in a couple of weeks is everything we've talked about so far are filters that are um, kind of symmetric, right? So all my filters I talked about were nicely symmetric around the middle. But we can do things, and we talked about this a little bit last time, that are kind of specific to certain edge orientations, right? So um, filters need not be symmetric. So for example, um, let's consider this filter, which I think we touched on a couple of lectures ago. So this is called a Sobel, um, I guess I would call this a Sobel uh, horizontal edge detector. And the transpose of that is basically the vertical edge detector. So now that we know how these things work, we can kind of see that, you know, for example here, if the intensities on this side are a lot brighter than the intensities on that side, then this is going to respond strongly to that type of edge. And we're going to talk about edge detection a lot more, so I don't want to talk about it too much now. But we can just kind of see the effect. So let's go back to um, let's go back to my image with the statue, right? So I'm going to define this Sobel edge detector, and I'm going to read in my statue image. And so if I apply the edge detector to this image, what I should see is, actually I'm going to make this, um, yeah. So now if I apply this edge detector to this image, um, let me just use, um, So now I'm going to start to see some responses to the horizontal edges. And to make this a little bit clearer, what I'm going to do is actually just I'm going to threshold the absolute value of this so we can see it kind of more like black to white instead of. So here, this is, is this thing that's responding strongly to you know, edges that are dark on the bottom and white on the top or something like that. So you're seeing that all these ridges in the mask are getting picked up by this edge detector. And all the little gradations here, to some extent, are getting picked up. On the other hand, the, the edges, like between, like the strong edge between this mask and the sky, that doesn't get picked up at all by the edge detector because it's not responding to that kind of edge, right? If I were to flip the detector around, then I should be able to see that edge, right? So if I were to flip this guy like this, now you see that I'm picking up the side to side edges, but I'm not responding very strongly to the up and down edges. Uh, I mean, this is a little bit hard to see because, for example, these edges here are like largely diagonal, and so my edge checker is responding to both horizontal and vertical edges. Okay, the last thing I want to say is that, you know, we made a big deal in signals and systems about linear time invariant systems, right? And in some sense, what we're talking about now is kind of like a 2D linear time invariant system. And that's what allows us to use 2D Fourier transforms and all that stuff. But there are nonlinear filters that can be good for image processing. And so, you know, one example, so not all image filters are linear. Right? That means that there are some things that we can't represent by basically a 
a weighted average of pixels. So a good example of that is called median filtering. So the idea is that my output pixel is the median of, for example, the 3 by 3 pixel neighborhood around where I am. And so why is this good? Well, let's consider, for example, let's suppose I have an image that looks like this. So these are just grayscale intensities. So what this is looking, you know, if I look at this region of pixels, I would say, okay, so this is a mostly dark gray block, right? Mostly pixels in the 40s and 50s, right? But there are a couple of outliers, right? Like this zero and this 255, right? So the middle, one of these pixels got flipped all the way to black, one of them got flipped all the way to white. And that can happen, for example, in certain kinds of sensor noise, right? So if, you're, if you've got a spacecraft that's taking images, Right, there may be some background thermal noise that creates this Gaussian noise like we talked about in burn notice, but then there's also going to be some occasional pixels that are just like totally whacked out that come from kind of what you call impulsive noise. And so sometimes this is called salt and pepper noise because it means that pixels have either been flipped to uh, black or white. And so just a quick illustration of that. So. So here's a really corrupted salt and pepper noise image. Yeah. Right, circuit board, you can see that, you can kind of tell what's going on, but there are black and white pixels all over the place, right? And if I were to try and remove this noise, like with my low pass filter, it would suck. So for example, if I were to make, I guess I still have this low pass filter from before, right? So if I were to try to filter this image, um, with uh, the low pass filter, what I would get would be, whoops, you'll never know. What I would get would be uh, this, right? So it's kind of like I've taken the black and white impulsive pixels and I've smeared them out across the image. It's even worse than it was before, right? Because now I've kind of, you know, taken the problems I had and spread them out over the whole image by averaging, right? And no amount of averaging is going to make this any better. So what I can do instead is I can say, OK, I take a region of pixels, right? So here's one of my problem pixels. And I say, OK, give me a list ordered from lowest to highest of your values, right? So the list that we produced here would be like 0, 46, 46, 47, 48, 50, 50, 52, 255. And the idea is that any weirdo pixels will float to the bottom or the top of this list, and then the middle pixel, which is the median, replaces this pixel here. Okay, So it's not something that I can get by averaging the local pixels. It's something where I make a, a pixel-dependent choice about what's going on. So this is definitely a nonlinear filter. And the effect of doing that on, an, on a salt and pepper noise image is very strong. So for example, if I were to so there's a command called medfilt2. So if my output is medfilt2 of the image, and I say, what is the my neighborhood of this image? I say 3 by 3. So now if I, I look at that, I see a huge difference, right? So let me compare these side by side. So Right, so the right-hand side is before, the left-hand side is after. And you can see that I've really mitigated this impulsive noise in the image to the point that I can actually almost like read, you know, there are symbols on the circuit board here that were almost illegible before, and now I can see them, right? Now, I haven't totally cleaned it up because there are some cases where, just by the way that the black and white pixels noise have, have added to this image, there are some places where there's more noise than actual good pixels, right? So, for example, there are still some black and white blotches in the middle, and I could try to mitigate that by making my median noise uh, neighborhood a little bit bigger. So let's try 5 by 5. And so now, whoops. 
And so now, you know, before and after that, I've kind of gotten rid of even these, you know, black and white pixels in the middle here, right? So, I mean, median filtering can be a very powerful technique, and it all comes down to understanding that, you know, you have to use certain, you know, filters for certain reasons, right? So, for example, Gaussian noise, which is kind of like the grainy film noise, I should use a low-pass filter. Salt and pepper, or, you know, impulsive noise, I should use a median filter. So you kind of have to know what the right tool for the job is. And I guess the, the one last thing I'll show you is that, you know, you could even use, um, I was thinking about it, so if I were to look at my uh, statue image again, yeah. I was thinking I could use this kind of median filter to try to get rid of these cracks in the wood, right? So, you know, like over time, the wood is weathered and I've got these cracks, right? So what I could try to do would be, I could try to run a median filter across this image and say, okay, these cracks are about, you know, three pixels wide, right? So maybe if I were to take the median like in a, you know, one by seven or a one by nine neighborhood, these dark pixels would flow to the bottom of the list. And so let's try doing that. So I think that if I were to take my median filter and use like say a one row by say nine pixel wide. Uh, okay, so median filter doesn't like that apparently. So I guess we have to do this. Explosion. Okay, so if I were to show my one image here and I were to show my other image here. And let's see what we got. So here you can see that, you know, there's definitely some degradation in the image, right? So I wouldn't say this looks so good over here, but I did get rid of the cracks, right? So like here, what used to be this long skinny crack running down the top of this guy's head, I did manage to, to get rid of that, right? So, um, you know, now I've replaced those pixels, I've filled them in with better pixels, right? But on the other hand, since there's lots of edges in this image, I really didn't make it look very good, right? I mean, um, maybe what I would do, right, is, so you guys on this last homework learned about this command called block processing, right, block proc, which means I can kind of locally apply some sort of filter to an image. What I might do instead is say, okay, I'm going to just isolate some region of the image and apply the median filter locally to get rid of the cracks just to that part of the image instead of running it across the whole image, right? So you could, you could apply any of these techniques locally instead of globally. Okay, so spatial filtering like this is a key image processing concept. So uh, homework three will focus almost entirely on that. Um, and so that'll be due next Thursday. I'll put it up later today. And um, that's about it. So I will see you next week. <laughs>